Grab a drink, grab some food, take your seats, please. The show is about to begin. Are we live, Danny? Okay, it is time for us to begin. Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us tonight. Welcome to the Quest Self-Directed IRA Social for Dallas. We've got a great little presentation for you tonight from one of our favorite speakers, who uh, I will allow him to introduce himself as he comes up. Um, just to give you an idea of a little bit of the format for tonight, though, um, this is meant to be the educational portion. We had some networking before. Uh, once we are done, you know, of course, there'll be Q&A for Scott along the way. And there will be networking after we conclude. But after Scott is done, we are also going to have a little bit of time for deal pitching. So if anybody has a deal or is looking for a deal, you'll have 90 seconds on the clock and you can get up and make your pitch. And again, add to the conversation. So with that, I'm just going to go over a couple of quick slides for you. Um, just again, to let you know a little bit about Quest. Of course, we are the leading self-directed IRA custodian in the state of Texas, the largest, 20,000 clients nationwide, over $3 billion under administration currently. And the thing that makes us a lot different than other custodians is the education and networking opportunities that we offer. So among the things that we have are, of course, our YouTube channel, our unique webinars, this event itself is also being simulcast and available afterwards on our YouTube channel. Uh, we do a lot in the way of, again, live presentations, live classroom uh, uh, educational pieces. And again, don't forget anything that we've done, you can find after the fact. If you have questions about self-directed IRAs, please feel free to reach out to one of our specialists. Uh, we're always available, 8.30 to 5.30 Central Time. Uh, the QR code that you see there actually scans to our calendar. So if you'd like to set up a time for a consultation to learn more, please feel free to do so. And of course, you can always call us. You can just uh, go onto our live chat or send us an email. Right now, we are doing a couple of promotions. Uh, if you have a deal that's ready to go and you bring over some funds, we have some rewards for deposits for new money coming over. And the amounts are specific in that they correlate to transactional fees. So if you are bringing over something for a new deal, you can basically have Quest pay for that deal in terms of the transaction fee. So again, this is for existing clients and new clients alike. And I do want to just also make mention, coming up, we will be having our own version of a multi-family summit in a couple of months. This will be up here in the Dallas area. We've selected a site over in Las Colinas, so it will be a one-day event. And again, a variety of different topics for anybody looking to do investing in anything related to self-directed IRAs and looking to learn more. All right, with that, I'm going to bring up our speaker for the night. And again, I'm gonna let Scott introduce himself because nobody can introduce Scott like Scott. Um, but I, <laughs> you should, you should. And um, just one little housekeeping item I do wanna mention. Um, again, we're gonna be uh, taking, are you okay with taking questions along the way, Scott? Okay, great. And then just uh, one thing to bear in mind, audience, if you are getting up and moving around, do be aware that again, this is being simulcast live on YouTube. So uh, if you would just be mon uh, mindful of the camera, every time we seem to have somebody who likes to stand right there. So uh, Danny is waving, that's the zone you want to avoid. <laughs> All right, Scott. Thank you. All right. Well, howdy. Oh, oh, click my clicker to the key. That's your clicker thing. And you have a laser pointer, too. Oh. Huh. All right. Oh, well, cool. I'll give you the sign. I'll try to figure it out. You know, it's all this technology. Yeah. 
Three buttons. I need all the help I can get, guys, at this point in time. Well, hope everybody is had a good day today. I like seeing a few of the old faces that have been here before and whatnot and those kind of items. So we're going to talk about, I saw this title that came out today on Quest. I'm going, huh? It was the three most important things you have to know for the real estate business. Was that what it was, Susan? Or something like that? I was going to come up and go, it's me, me, and me. But, but no. Now, that might be the answer, but not tonight. So we're going to have fun and talk about the art of money and just put a little bit. You know, it's, I think, uh, something that's near and dear to all of our hearts a little bit along the way. And so, you know, in business, guys, and I, how many people in this room are all in real, are real estate investors? Who wants to be a real estate investor? Who's, who's not a real estate investor but wants to be one? Have you bought a house before? Okay, so you have your money in Quest. You're thinking about getting your money in Quest. It's a good place to put it. By the way, a, a self-directed IRA for investment opportunities, learn it. Talk to the right people about it. It's something that you really need to, to learn. You're a young kid. Time to do it now. Not when you're 50, 60, older, like TJ. Um, anyhow, so you know when we are in our business, guys, we're talking about money. We all want to find out what is our return on investment, one of the things we're looking at. We're looking for profit or we're looking for equity, you know, and some of us just like to eat. Some of you all like to eat more than I do. So as we go through this, oh, this is going to take me a while to figure this out, guys. Someone tell me what are the three most important things in real estate? This is a trick question. Come on. What's the, what is the obvious answer? Thank you. How many people have actually ever heard that, right? Everybody in this room has heard location, location, location. So I'm going to dispel that myth a little bit and say, no, wrong. So what is the answer? Wait, wait. But, but for real estate, it's not really location, location. But for real estate investors, you come with money, money, money. Well, I'm telling you, by the way, very good. But I'm telling you, for real estate investing, it is money, money, money. And for real estate, do you know why? Do you want to know why? Yeah. <laughs> so the first part of that equation is it is about the availability of money. So let me ask you a common sense question. If you find this awesome deal you can buy and you don't have the access to the capital to buy it, can you buy that property? She's taking notes. Can you buy that property? If you don't have the money, can you buy it? So it's... That's right. It's about the availability of the money, right? So you need to go out and figure out, how do I get money? Anybody here sitting on piles and piles of cash? TJC Susan afterwards, please. Anybody help? You know, it is. And I'll tell you one thing. When you talk about the availability of money, too many investors, they, they always look at how much is it going to cost me to borrow that money. And by the way, that's an important thing to look at. I get it. But it's not the most important thing along the way. So the second part of the equation is it's about the cost of money, as I just said. And one of the things we have to do in business, guys, is you are constantly chasing money. I don't care what you, what you do, but in this business, you are constantly chasing money one way or the other, and you've got to find cheaper sources of money to become more and more successful. You cannot borrow hard money. Does anybody, does anybody know what hard money is? Does anybody not know what hard money lending is? Blue shirt. I mean, I've heard of it. I don't know. That, that's private capital, usually companies for the most part, could be private, that lends you money based on the asset not based on your credit, okay? By the way, if you don't know something, I'm talking about it, raise your hand and I'll answer your question for you. You can't go through life being stupid. Not that you're, you're stupid or anything. <laughs> anyway, I want you to learn and understand what we're talking about. It'll help you <laughs> go through the thing a little bit. And I'm just flat out goofy most of the time, so forgive me as we go through and do these things. 
And guys, as I said along the way, today is kind of fun because I get the chance I can answer questions, anything you want to talk about, about real estate investing. That's the fun part about doing this, you know, at this point in time in my career. And uh, I know he asked me to introduce myself a little bit. I didn't do it. I'm sorry. So my name is Scott Horn. My real life is I'm a real estate attorney and title attorney. It is why I tell most normal people. But what I really am is I'm a real estate investor. I'm a real estate lender. We build houses. We do property tax lending. Uh, I've been very fortunate over the years. I've bought about 3,700 single family homes now to date. That's buy, rehab, sell. Uh, we've done some 4,000 plus today hard money loans. Um, I've had a chance to build 50, 55 houses. We got three getting ready to go up right now. Uh, I understand property tax lending. I used to own a mortgage company. And all that crap means is I just have a lot of experience in our industry that I get a chance to come back and share with you guys in this regard. Whether it's paying cash for houses, borrowing money from banks, which I've done almost a billion dollars in borrowing today from my small banks. And in the greater scheme of things, that ain't a lot of money today. When it's just you signing the dotted line, guys, it makes you pucker a lot. You know, I'm sorry. Um, and all it is, is, is a, it's a knowledge base that we've been able to accumulate that I get a chance to come back and share that with you guys in whatever way it might be. Because we do have some subject matter expertise, at least in our single family investment world. I noticed you had the multifamily thing coming up. I'm an old multifamily guy from the early mid 1980s which is probably why I do single family today only. And I see all this stuff out there in the, in the internet. It's like, why I never want to do single family and only do multifamily and vice versa and all that kind of stuff. And I'll just tell you this, when you go through the real estate crash and you watch the multifamily guys get slaughtered, you watch the commercial guys get slaughtered because they're calling the notes due left and right, you go, holy cow. And one of the reasons I think I'm in the single family world today is there are multiple exit strategies for single family homes that you don't have that same exit strategy in large commercial properties or large or larger but no apartment complexes but again everybody is different in this industry and there's nothing right or wrong about it <clears throat> so if cost of money is our i got sidetracked sorry is our second faucet up there our third is it's learning how to save money along the way and I got a chance to learn a long time ago, this is an important concept in our business. And, you know, it starts with how you buy your, your real estate, you know, negotiate better deals if you possibly can. It's about how do you get better title fees or recognizing what are junk fees on your closings. You know, I, I, we had a deal, we had deals a long time ago. We were buying probably 20 plus houses a month back in the, the, the through that, the 1990s. Guys, that's a month. And, you know, my title company at the time, well, they were charging me 10 bucks for this, 25 bucks for that. They were just junk fees. And you go, oh, it's only 10 bucks. Oh, it's only 25 bucks. But what's, you know, what's 10 times 400 deals a year buying and selling? Well, that's 4,000 bucks, right? And then you add the other fees in. And all of a sudden you start saying it's a lot of money. It was another thing that I don't know what y'all experience out there if you buy houses. You know, when people, you buy a house and they leave all their stuff in the house, right? How much does it cost to clear a house out? What's the cost of a dumpster today? Susan, what's the cost of a dumpster today? A cost of a dumpster. One dumpster. Yeah, one dumpster. Yeah, they're, they're, they're pricey, right? Plus you have labor to clear it out, et cetera. So imagine if people leave your houses and... You're, you're getting hit with a $600 fee for the dumpster and you got to pay a thousand dollar fees for somebody to go out there and clean the house out and whatnot. Multiply that by 20. And it's amazing when you buy houses, how people just leave stuff behind a lot of stuff behind. Sometimes I'm learning how to negotiate your contracts and put provisions in your contract to prevent that from happening. Important things to do you know, along the way. Looking at your closing costs from your lender negotiating these any way you can. Can you ask your seller to pay your closing costs? So by the way, how many people in this room, I'm curious about this real quick, were in real estate investing before 2009? A whole two, three of you? A whole, yes or no? You can't be in and out, come on. Who actually did real hard business, okay? 
you know, it used to be prior to 0809, you'd negotiate contracts, and oftentimes, especially in the retail world, sellers were paying buyers closing costs. You don't see that right now. And all of you are just getting in this business. You've been in this constant, straight up, you know, uh, industry. It kind of started off slow coming out of the, the crash in 08, 09, and it slowly, and then it went vertical two or three years ago. And now that curve has stopped and it's coming back down again. And guess what? Things are get, going to get back to normality, as I call it. You're going to start having more traditional contracts and things of this nature. It's going to take a little bit longer to sell your house. You aren't going to sell your house in three to five days. It's, it's going to be more like three to five months. And it's just understanding the basic things that are happening out there. But now we can ask people to pay our closing costs and fees because if you don't ask, you don't what? You don't get. Simple stuff out there. Learning. Yes, ma'am. Last line. Lower cost without cutting. I'll get there. Quality. Yes, ma'am. They cut it off somehow. I'm not sure how. There was something in there. but So on construction, guys, and I'll get to your point very quickly. Learning how to, to understand construction, learning how to get costs down, finding better ways of doing it. Somebody in the room, who's, who's done a rehab project in the room? How did you find your, how did you find your contractor? Um, called other friends that were, 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 were investors or in the first couple I did myself, which was not fun. So you got some references. Oh, yeah. By the way, I did my first three myself, too. Yeah, no, not doing it again. Been there, done that, helps you understand things. Yeah, no. But you, you, you ask people about it. We used to drive neighborhoods, guys, and we'd see construction going on. We'd stop, get out, walk in, talk to the people. Anybody ever done that before? It works. You know, and you start seeing the, the work they do, the quality they do, and you start finding people out there. <clears throat> but uh, it's also important when you're doing construction, don't cut the corners. Don't tell me you're doing a rent-ready construction. I hate that term in the marketplace. There's no such damn thing as rent-ready. It's either done right or it's not done right, right? You don't have to go over the top. I get that. But learning how to do things will help you maximize and save money because it'll help your house sell quicker. Uh, one of the things I like to talk about is something I learned a long time ago, which is, you know, never pay cash for a house. Ever. You can pay cash for a house. Just put a lien on your property from company A to company B or from your personal name to your acquisition company. Why? Because down the road, if you want to borrow money on the house, and guys, everything happens, everything changes. And when you learn how to do this, where you can assign that mortgage to your small commercial bank maybe, guess what? You don't have to go back and do title insurance again. It also creates lots of other things for you along the way from asset protection because you actually have the mortgage on the property. If you had to foreclose on yourself for some goofy reason, could you do that? Yeah. No future financing purposes come out to play. And if you're in the seller finance world, there's some Dodd-Frank issues about that as well with this 120-day rule that is out there that most people don't even know about. But anyway, little things like that save a lot of money. I will tell you in my career, that has saved me probably seven to eight million dollars over the years. Okay, I saw the eyebrows, but I've been doing it for 30 years, so I got it. But anyway, in, in all honesty, it has saved me a ton of money. I just got lucky and learned how to do things like that. But all these things add up because where else do you want to put this money? In their pocket or in your pocket, right? We want to find ways to keep as much money in our pocket as possible along the way. Yes, ma'am. What are you looking at? The principle, the title. Yes. L E is the concept, the idea. AL is capital. I have no idea what that applies to. I have to talk to my VA about that. It applies to basics of money. How about that? So, anyway. OPM stands for? So guys, one thing I've learned in my career for some 30 plus years is always use other people's money. Now, I know that we're here at an IRA. We're going to talk about that in a minute too and the application of all that. But guys, one thing I will tell you from the guy that's probably done more deals than all of y'all in the room combined is you will need cash. 
you're going to need reserve funds. Things happen. TJ, you've been around for a while. Do things happen? I will tell you guys that one of my fun stories I like to tell out there occasionally is I bought a house down in the south part of Pleasant Grove, Buku, years ago. And it was actually the house where they had filmed this movie called Born on the Fourth of July that had Tom Cruise in it. And this was the little house, cute little neighborhood. And we walked into this house and it was like, awesome. Bathroom floor was caved in. We knew what it needed. It needed a lot of work. And we anticipated all that and we closed the deal. We get in there. And our contractor comes back and goes, dude, all your floor joists are rotten. Not only that, all your seal place, plates are rotten. You have to replace everything. And this was a house that we had bought for like thirty-five or 40000 bucks. Yeah, we can't do that today, right? That's not even lot cost anymore. And the, the cost to do the floor joists, et cetera, was over $10,000. So it was more than 25% of our whole cost of the entire home. And you're going, oh, crap. Where does that money come from? You can't go back to your lender and borrow more money. So you need cash reserves because those kind of things do happen out there. So just understand that that will come up one way or the other. You always hope for the best, but guys, in real life, in our business, we move too fast. We don't have time to go through and check everything in the world out. So keep your cash back in reserve when you can. So where does your OPM come from? It's on the it comes from everywhere, right? You know, it comes either from, if you have an IRA here, you can use your IRA capital or other people with IRAs. You can use private capital. You know, you can use institutional capital. And by that, I mean, typically your, your, your commercial banks, you know, or you can learn, you know, borrow money from asset-based lenders, the hard money lenders out there, whatever it might be. And so when we're looking at this and the availability of money, this is a toughie. Tell us how you do, how you find private capital. Who has borrowed private capital in this room? Susan, raise your hand. <laughs> Susan, how do you find private capital? This is my partner, by the way. That's why I'm calling on her. Huh? You do. And by the way, you have been awesome at finding private capital. And you know, and we did a podcast on this just last week for a group out of Houston. And um, it's just being smart. You know, you go to a party, every, every, guys, everybody in our out there wants to be in real estate investing one way or the other. But most people are just flat out chicken to do it. They're afraid of risk, whatever it might be. You name the issue, but they all want to be involved. Well, could, could they be involved by being your lender? Yeah. You just got to ask the questions out there and it comes up. You just got to open your mouth and figure things out along the way. When you're talking about private capital, though, you know, understand if you're going to do a real short term loan, the rates might be a little bit higher. If you're going to do a midterm loan, okay, they're going to be a little bit lower. Maybe you got to amortize it. One of the things that we do in our business when we buy a home, whether we use bank financing or maybe we're buying it through creative financing, we borrow private capital for the difference. Why? Because banks today require 20 to 25% down up front. Where's that going to come from? It either comes from your pocket or from a private lender. Well, if you're in a second lien position with a private lender because your bank is in first lien position, you need to pay that loan off quickly because they're at risk. If the bank was to foreclose on you, they get wiped out. You don't want that to happen. It might wipe out the lien, but it doesn't wipe out the debt. So you want to make sure you pay them off very, very quickly if you can along the way. Another thing is, is I watch a lot of investors who talk to private lenders and they're paying these people 12%, 15%, whatever it might be. They give equity on top of all that. Do you have to do that? No. Negotiate your deal. Be smart. You know, I'm, I'll, I got another point in here. I might be jumping the gun here a little bit. I'm just going to jump the gun anyway. When I first got started in this business, you know, I didn't have you know what from Shinola. I didn't have any ability in this business. I didn't have any any um, history in it. I didn't have any anything to back it. I didn't have a financial statement. Hell, I didn't know what a financial statement was. And my rates started out at 18 percent interest. I grant you that was a long time ago, guys. Houses were a lot cheaper, but that was the going rate back then. And you learn how to start negotiating better rates and better terms along the way. <sighs> so the next part of the availability of capital is institutional capital. So I'm going to ask a question I always ask audiences. Who banks with Bank of America? 
not in business, who banks with Bank of America personally? Who banks with Wells Fargo? Who banks with Chase? Who banks with, with Citibank? <laughs> so, one thing I will tell you guys is those banks will never, ever, 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 ever do business with you in our industry. It's not their model. They just don't do it. So why, if you're in this business and you want to be a real estate investor, you want to bank with them? Go find your small commercial bank, create a relationship, ask questions, see what they do, and figure out how to find the money with those banks. They're looking for good people, for good loans. They're looking for relationships. So be smart, you know, along the way out there. Who has borrowed money from small commercial banks? Raise your hands. Come on. You've never borrowed money from a commercial bank? I'm not smart enough. Oh, whatever. Who'd you borrow your money from? Uh, Private? I, I use mostly my IRA money. It's great. So what if you did 15 houses a month? Could you finance all that? Sometimes you just got to find access to other money. You know, I find that we have access to a lot of private capital, but you also need access to a lot of institutional capital that's out there. So if you do go apply to a bank, you know, you got to learn what banks want and need. Um, uh, I'm a storyteller, but when I got started in this business, you know, I was young and, um, well, I'm jumping the gun here a bit. I'm gonna, I'll come back to that story. But banks are looking for financial statements. So you got to know what a financial statement is. They're looking for deposit relationships. They're looking for credit. And they're going to give you a five-year note, usually on a 15-year you know, amateur eyes loan of some type. And every five years, it's going to renew and extend. Some banks do three years right now just because of prime rate moving so much up and down. Everybody's a little bit different. Now, a lot of investors want to go to the mortgage world where they borrow money from mortgage companies. If you do that, you got to know the rules and regulations. Some mortgage companies will lend you a max of four deals, period, including your homestead. Some will go up to 10. That is going to cap you, though, if you're going on your personal credit in the mortgage world out there. With commercial banks, you don't have that issue. You can do unlimited. Yeah, you get a little bit lower pricing. You're going to get a 30-year amortized loan versus a 15. So I'm going to ask a stupid question for everybody. Would you rather pay your house off in 15 years or pay it off in 30 years? 30? Who else? I'd rather have a loan for 30 than pay it off in 15. Good answer. Unfortunately, in small banks, you don't get that option. But the key to our business is debt reduction, and we'll get there and talk about that in a moment also. Okay, so when we're looking at the availability of money. Who has ever in this room has done a creative finance transaction? That means buying a house subject to the existing debt. That means an owner finance transaction, whatever it might be. Raise your hand. So three of you have done that, right? How many have actually hurt? Have you not bought a house creatively? Are you serious? Oh, my goodness. Anyway, guys, this is forthcoming. This is going to be huge in the marketplace. It was huge in 08, 09 when the crash hit for about three or four years, and it took off and exploded. It kind of calmed down a little bit. Guess what's fixing to happen? Heard a stat the other day that in Texas, 8.8% of homeowners are in default. That's a big number. And 30% are in forbearance. That means they're in trouble. So what are they going to do? What we get a chance to do is solve their problem. And learning how to buy houses creatively is one of the best techniques to do it right now. A lot of people bought houses in the last two, three, four years. They have great interest rates, two, two and a half, three, three and a half percent interest rates. What are bank rates today? Anybody know? That's a mortgage rate. What are commercial bank rates? Eight to nine. Prime rate is 8%, guys. And banks don't lend you subprime. They lend you prime plus, right? So would you ever pay 8.5% on a loan or 3.5% on a loan? Okay, at least someone's... Who said 3? Okay, at least you're halfway smart. Halfway. You got to get there and do this stuff. But seriously, learning how to utilize other people's credit 
in the creative finance world is an awesome technique. Not only is it an awesome technique on how to buy houses, it's an awesome way to blend in with your Roth IRAs and things of that nature as well. So when, how many people, how many people, y'all, everybody here has, has, has an IRA except for one guy? Who doesn't have an IRA here? Okay. You just showed up because I look pretty and you want to see me? Whatever. So guys, I'm just telling you, Roth IRAs and, and self-directed IRAs are awesome things to have. And again, right now, learning how to blend your funds, I think, is an important thing to learn. Whether it's using your IRA money and somebody else's IRA money. Has anybody done that before? Okay, I've done that before as well. You know, you can take your IRA capital and blend it with private capital. Anybody done that before? Okay. You know, you can take it, you can go borrow money from the bank. And then, you know, as long as the bank has, does require the IRA to be responsible. So it's a, um, what's the word I'm looking for? What's the word I'm looking for? I went brain dead. Non-recourse, thank you. Non brain dead. Good answer back there. Um, and, and, and banks will do that because they're going to have you sign a personal guarantee anyway. They don't care. You know, you're on the hook for that bank loan out there. So all asset-based lenders are typically, they, they, don't, they don't make, they'll do a non-asset, since they're asset-based lenders, they don't care about the recourse part of that. It's an asset-based loan. Most of the time you're going to sign a personal guarantee anyway. So all these things help you blend that rate with your IRA, IRA capital and maximize your return along the way. You know, one thing that hit me so hard about, oh, I don't know, about a month ago, I was talking to my bankers after I refinanced a loan, and I looked at the rate, and it was 8.75. And I called them and said, what the hell? I just did a deal 30 days ago, and my rate was like 6%. It may have been 45 days ago. And he goes, dude, prime rate's 8. You know, we got to make money from our end, too. And I went, do the math. So I did a quick calculation. So, you know, a year ago, guys, we were buying houses at 80 cents on the dollar. Everybody remember that a little bit? Who was buying houses in here at 80 cents on the dollar? Anybody? Come on. Who, who, who was? Have y'all not bought any houses lately? Because a year ago, if you're in the market, you're buying houses at 80 cents on the dollar pretty much across the board, it seemed. Well, if you borrowed money from a bank at those rates, the, to, to break even, and actually you'd be a little bit short still, you got to buy the same house at 70 cents of the dollar just to break even dollar for dollar on your financing costs. So if you want to know how houses reduce in value and why, there's one quick reason right there because you can't afford it. Financially, it just doesn't work anymore. So it kind of, you know, knocks you out there a little bit. But learning how to, even if you got to pay bank rates at eight, if you have an IRA capable where you can put some cash into it and the bank as well, guys, it helps you get that deal done that's the important thing about our business. So <clears throat> I love these, these great eyes of mine. I'm going to walk closer to the screen. Um, does that mean I'm getting old? Older or whatever it might be. You know, with private capital, guys, I'll just tell you real quick. On my first rehab deal I did, which was 1990. Um, how long ago was that? That was 33. Oh, bite me wasn't that long. It's 33. Anyway, so I'm this young. I'm, I'm 26 years old. I have a contractor buddy of mine who I've met, and we decided we'd, we'd try our hand at doing a deal. Anybody remember, the, remember the, the, the club on Lower Greenville called Fast and Cool? Anybody remember that going back? I'm showing my age. It was big time in Dallas, y'all. Anyway, he did all the inside. They had the girls dancing in cages, actually, in there. That's showing my age a little bit. But anyway, uh, he had done all that. We decided to do a deal, but it's like, where are you getting the money from? No one's going to loan a snotty-nosed 26-year-old money. You know, I didn't have any money. I didn't have any cash. I barely had a bank account, you know. And so I'm at our church one day. I'm talking to, uh, I'm a lawyer, so I'm talking to another lawyer. Only problem is this guy was the senior partner for Thompson & Knight, one of the biggest law firms in, in, in Texas, and what, a huge law firm across the country. And he's the senior litigation guy. And I'm telling him what we're trying to do and is talking to him. And I just opened my mouth and I asked the simple question, hey, would you be interested in something like this? 
And maybe he took pity on me. I don't know what it was, but he said, yes. It was just doing that. And we hear so many people, in the, I point to Susan again, because we hear so many people out in the marketplace all the time who are scared to death just to open that door a little bit and just to chit chat and go, would you be interested? If I could offer you, say, 8% return on your money for a little bit of time, would that something that be interested to you? If I could give you a first lien on real estate, say at 75 cents on the dollar, is that something you would want to consider? Ask the question, guys, because it did. It worked for us, and it got me started. And you've got to want it to go get it, okay? You can't. Don't worry about screwing up, okay? You're going to screw up. You have to want it. When I got started again after our, we were rolling back through the early 1990s, and guys, I'm paying at that time 17.75% interest rate, and what I now calculated was 15 points. Now, grant you, I'm paying, I'm buying a house for 20,000 bucks. I know that sounds ridiculous today. And they're charging me $1,500 uh, or $2,500 in points on this thing. It's like, are you kidding me? I mean, it was, it, it was complete usury that I now know. I didn't know it back then. I just wanted the money. That's all I wanted to do. I wanted to buy the house. Anyway, you, you go out and you, you do that, and you make the deal work, whatever it takes. But along the way, as I said earlier, you've got to find the cheaper sources of capital because you cannot maintain those kind of things too often. Okay, so no, along the way again, golly, my eyes just go poof. You know, we'll talk about the availability of the money we said earlier. It's not about the cost of the money. You got to constantly find cheaper money. I just told you my first lender out there. And what was really interesting, this guy had a, a, a vision that his goal was to lend money to a lot of young investors and to foreclose on the properties. We were the only company that he never foreclosed on ever. And that was just his business model. Lend at high cost, high not what, and that way he got free houses he didn't have to go out and look for. And there are snakes in the grass out there that do those kind of things, you know, even to this day along the way. Um, but you've got to hunt those, the cheaper ways of finding money along the way. And if I find out I look this way, I can see that thing a lot better. And it helps me remember what I'm talking about up here. You know, and remember things that, you know, as you're working on cheaper money, when I say relationship lending, let me tell you how important relationship lending is with your banks performing every single time. When the real estate crash hit in, in uh, August of 08, within 30 days, I lost $50 million in lines of credit. Most people I knew in the industry went, they were out of business. They filed bankruptcy, they were done and gone. But because I had built relationships with my lenders for so long, they knew I was going to take care of the problem. They went to bat. What I didn't know, I learned four or five years later, that the Fed is sitting in the back offices of all of these banks. And when the Fed says jump, they go, how high? And everything else rolls downhill from there. But because of that relationship, they went, no, we're not going to foreclose on Scott. We're going to take care of it. And sure enough, we found the way out of the deal, worked it out, and paid off all of our deals you know, over time along the way. But you've got to learn how to do that along the way. You know, I ask questions all the time about who controls all the money in the world. Anybody want to tell me? <laughs> okay. The next person, who controls it? below him? The banks do. What do banks do? Banks finance, right? Learn the financing principle of what banks do and learn how to emulate it. That's how they got all the money to start off with, right? There's a reason they do what they do. They're not in business to lose money. They're in business to, to, to make money. So one thing I see a lot of investors do is they want to make that awesome deal. They want to shoot for the moon, right? You know, I, I often call it, I call it kind of the, the baseball principle up here, you know. How do you win baseball games, guys? Do what? Oh, come on. How do you win baseball games? Singles. You don't win a game hitting home runs. Baseball games are run on the singles, whatever it might be, right? Common sense out there, you do that. And so many investors of the IC, they're shooting for the moon out there. Another thing I learned is in our business, guys, things are pyramidal. And by that, well, I got taught back in the late 80s, early 1990s by this one, 
by this lender who was just jacking me around. His comment was, guys, everybody wants to buy that. So I'm trying to, I'm going to use, everybody wants to buy that $300,000 house. You know, it's great. Nice location, nice neighborhood, maybe white collar, long sleeve people. Fantastic. He says, the problem is, what's your risk of loss on that, if, they, if people vacate that house? What's your risk of loss? It's 100%. It goes vacant, right? He says, so focus on buying two houses at 150000 each. He says, okay, now you're going to make a little bit more money, maybe 10 to 15% more than that 300000 But now what is your risk of loss if a house goes vacant? This is high math. What is it? It's 50%, right? But he said, if you really want to make money, go out and buy four $75,000 houses. Okay, I know you can't buy that in today's marketplace here, but back then we're talking 150, 25, and we could really do this. And you, and you go, why? And he says, well, no one wants to deal down there and get your hands dirty. And so we came up with a philosophy, and I call it the Walmart theory of houses. What does Walmart do, guys, besides sell everything in the world? They deal with the masses, right? They deal with the 85% of, of the masses down here. If you look at that $300,000 house and in the same retail scenario, who would be the, the pinnacle of that retail? Come on. Anybody here, here of needless markup? Neiman Marcus? Okay. So guess what? Do, do the clientele of Neiman Marcus ever go away? No. They really don't. And everybody chases that middle percentage out there. We call that the middle management because no one wants to deal, get their hands dirty you know, a few people will chase the high end stuff, but nobody chases that middle. So learning how to chase, you know, the people, at the lower end a little bit is truly where money comes. And you learn along the way of things like that is, again, you know, asset accumulation. To build wealth, guys, you have to accumulate assets. If you don't accumulate assets, what are you doing? You have a job. Who likes having a job? Who, who in the room actually has a real job? I got six. Who has a real job? Come on, raise your hand. What do you do? Uh, okay, so you got an actual job. You're looking to invest. I got it. No one else is willing to talk about that, but they have jobs somewhere along the way. And, you know, again, it's okay to borrow debt. You know, you, you look at, um, what's the dude's name? Um, Ramsey. Dave Ramsey. So he teaches, no, no debt, no debt, no debt, no debt. And by the way, he used to be in the real estate investment industry, if you don't know, he lost everything in the crash. But there is a time and place for good debt and smart debt. You know, if it's secured, I'll tell you one day back in the 90s, I literally woke up in the middle of the night. I'm in a cold sweat. I'm going, oh, my gosh, I owe a million and a half dollars. There's no way. Excuse me, I owed a million dollars. And it was like, there's no way I could ever pay that back. What am I going to do? I was in a panic. And then you go, wait a minute. That's in 10 houses. They're worth $1.5 million. Um, you go, I'm okay because all 10 aren't going to vacate at one time, right? You learn the little smart things like that that go along the way. And then the other thing is, is the faster you eliminate your debt, guys, the faster you will accumulate wealth. You've got to figure that out. If you don't do that to get into a way to eliminate debt, you create positive reoccurring cash flow, you're going to be on the hamster wheel forever. So you can make good money, guys, by having reasonable returns. Everybody in this room is in a different financial position. There are those people that have real jobs who are just looking for a way to invest money and make, what, a, what does a bank pay us today for an interest rate? Apple. The who? Apple. Apple? For how long? Yeah. Yeah. You know, money market rates are dirt cheap, almost Zippo. You know, CD rates aren't much better that are out there. Um, it's okay if we make a 7, an 8, a 9% return. Do you have to make a 20% return or 30%? No. Making a reasonable return on your investment works, and everybody is in a different position in this industry, in this business based upon where you are in your career, your business, where it might be. 
And if I can find a way to put money into a house and I can make, say, a 9% return instead of a 20, okay. So long as I'm doing some risk analysis the right way, I want to do this kind of things. You've got to be smart, guys, in doing this. You've got to follow the market because the market changes. Like the last six months ago, right? Things just went poof. Was anybody really expecting that to happen? Thank you. Um, I'm going to call you Karnak. Do you even know who Karnak is? Anybody know who Karnak? <laughs> Who's Karnak? It's the Johnny Carson guy. Right? He could uh, tell you what the answer was before he... Oh, you youngins. If you haven't seen this, look it up on, on, on YouTube, whatever, where he'd, he'd get an envelope and he'd tap his little hat and he'd give an answer and then he'd open up and read the question. Watch it. Anyway, you know, and with market changes, guys, well, I'll tell you, there's a time to fix and flip. And like the last three or four years, there was a time to fix and flip, right? Prices just kept going up. You can make more and more money. Awesome. There's also a time to stop and to buy and hold. And one thing I'll teach you is if you can learn how to buy and hold, that is where you're going to generate your largest you know, wealth generator in the marketplace. But different times dictate different things in how we spend our money. So... <clears throat> You know, I will tell you that when I got started in business, we started retailing properties. Who started by buying houses, fixing and selling them for cash? Okay, we did the same thing. You have to learn when you do that, though, you got to find a way to make that deal happen, to buy that deal along the way. Today, as I said earlier, we're getting back to what I call normality right now in our marketplace. You know, we're not having these stupid numbers. You're not getting 35 offers on a property anymore. That those days are over, so you got to get used to, to how it used to be. The problem is, is most of you don't know how it used to be. So when I say your average sale is going to be three to five months, maybe longer, it will. Um, you have to learn creative financing, the subject to business and owner financing. Maybe you want to learn selling of a mortgage, and I'll get into that a little bit later on. You know, in my business, guys, what I did is I went from the retail business, that's all I knew when I got started. I didn't know anything else. I was going to fix a house up, I was going to sell it and make money. Great. I didn't know about anything else in the marketplace. From there, I started learning some buy and hold mechanisms. You know, okay, we're buying a lot of houses. I didn't have the money to carry it. I had to find a way to get them income producing. Thank goodness back in the day, I could use things like contract for deeds and things like this that you can't do today. And it helped us to get our houses in I'm producing. From there, I went to learning how to sell a mortgage. So I would generate a, a creative finance transaction. Then I learned, that, oh, I can take this piece of paper and I can sell it and make money. I didn't know you can do that. Has anybody ever sold a mortgage in the room? There's three of y'all. That's good. Okay. Got it. Do you raise your hand to everything? <laughs> I'm poking fun. You know, I started to learn how to pool my mortgages, meaning instead of selling one at a time, I started pooling them, and I was selling a $5 million pool. Why? I got a 10% bump for doing that. Okay. But you have to be able to get there. And eventually, because I was doing all this stuff, I was able to start paying off houses and going debt-free. And once you go debt-free, what happens? Well, you got leverage. But what, what's the main goal of going debt-free? You get cash flow, right? Can you eat on equity? Well, can, but you can eat with cash flow, right? Guys, you got to get to the cash flow position. So, by the way, I could expound on all of that stuff going on and on and on. So, on April the 15th, what's that first day of? Property tax protests, right? Forget paying tax. I would ask who in this room likes to pay. But who likes to pay taxes? I actually like paying taxes. You know, it's okay because it means I'm making money. And I don't mind paying taxes. It's just which everybody would pay taxes, not 50% of us or something like that. Uh, I won't go on the, that tangent anywhere. But one of the things to really understand right now, who has protested their property taxes before? Okay, good. Did you like the experience? Okay. So, I, I, we protest taxes every year. 
So in Texas, your time to protest is April 15th to May 15th. If you miss it, you miss it. So little things you need to know, because this is an important way of understanding this. So let me give you an example of, of what I mean by doing this. So I bought a house. This goes back. This is a good example of one. Um, gosh, this is probably 2012, 13, 14. I don't remember. Anyway, the house was a $200,000 home. And they were paying taxes at almost $200,000. Guys, I bought this house for $60,000. And I bought it in July. So if I'm buying houses in a house in July and in July, how many months of tax paration am I going to get from the seller? Six. Seven. I think June is six. So I'm getting seven months of tax paration, right? So what are taxes? What were the taxes on this $200,000 house? Anybody want to take a guess? So your tax rates here in Texas are like 0.03 per thousand. So they were almost $6,000 a year for the taxes. Why the hell they didn't protest them somewhere, I don't know. So how did I buy a $60,000 house or a $200,000 house, 60,000 bucks? It needed major work, right? It needed 60,000 of work to this home. It wasn't some home run deal I got lucky on. It was still a pretty good deal though at the time. Um, and so at closing, I got, I got, what did I get? The taxes were, Six grand, that's 500 bucks a month. I got $3,500 paid to me at closing in taxes, right? And that was in July. So what's the problem with this? It's past the time frame, right? Are you telling me I got five minutes or 10 minutes? Huh? 10, okay. So <clears throat> it's past the time frame, right? And most people go, oh, it's too late. I can't do anything. Again, knowledge is power in our business, guys. And so there's a little thing called 2525D in the property tax code. That's the provision. And we call it the one-third rule, meaning if the house is overassessed by more than one-third of its value, I can protest my taxes anytime. Everybody got that? Has anybody ever used that before? You do now. We're going to be doing a Facebook Live next week on that. Monday, with my old business partner, Dave Ariant, who protested probably 10,000. He's protested probably 30,000 times our houses over the years, and he, he came from that world originally. So anyway, I protested that, and what did I get my taxes down to, you think? I got them down to $60,000. So would you rather pay taxes on $60,000 or $200,000? This is rocket science. So that means... That year, if you're taking 0.03% of your, of your value, taxes were $1,800. They gave me $3,500. How much money did I make? I made $1,700 just because they didn't protest their taxes. Did I make money the next year as well? Why? Yeah. Why? The taxes are still low. They don't jump back up to that full value overnight again. And so it's how to learn how to make money and save money over time. In our business, guys, you've got to learn all these variations of how to, you know, make money. You, you, you make money by saving money. You can create situations out there. Now, when you're protesting taxes, if you've never done it before, <clears throat> and you're doing it from April to May, you're doing the property value as of January 1, not January 2, January 1. Your house burns down January 1, and you want to protest taxes in April? There's a little word for that, we, or an acronym. We call that SOL. You're done. Can't do it. It's whatever the value was prior to. And, guys, I have bought a home like this where I bought the house that was a burnout in mid-January, and it doesn't matter. The, the fire happened, like, on the 10th or the 12th of January. It's gone doesn't matter. You're paying whatever the taxes were as of 1-1. One, one. Now, if you want to go in and protest taxes, you got to know what you need to do and how you need to do it. It ain't rocket science. You can go down to Dallas Central Appraisal District. They're off of Stimmons, which is 35, somewhere right kind of across from, uh, from Parkland Hospital a little bit, a little bit to the north of that. Anyway, easy to find. Yes? 
just so you know that not all appraisal districts are nice. Oh, I oh, he said not all appraisal districts are nice. The guy, right? Like, so if you were in Tarrant County, like uh -huh. I am, they make it impossible for you to to protest. Well, I'm in gonna fact, give you a, they make it. They go out of their way to make it impossible. For I'm gonna you. give you a secret in a moment. But I, I like I understand that about really I I like Tarrant actually, Collins a pain, Rockwall's a pain. Oh yeah. So you got to protest your date through the first. And guys, when you go in there, if you bought your house and you have a settlement statement, is that evidence of value? It is. One of the things that they, they that you run it up against in the appraisal district is, oh, it wasn't an arm's length sale, meaning that house wasn't listed by multiple listing and there wasn't multiple offers and blah, 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 whatever. Just be prepared for that. So you can go in with your, your, your settlement statement. I take in my contractor estimate. And guys, I don't need to do my wholesale contractor estimate. I can, I can do a retail contractor estimate showing what legitimate repairs are to that home. So I couple my, my settlement statement with my repair takeoff, and I can go and go, look, I bought this $200,000 house for $60,000 because the damn thing needed $60,000 of work done to it, and it can't pass appraisal standards, and only an investor can buy it. That's just the bottom line of the deal. So... Oftentimes, the answer to your question is, is I try to go down and I want to meet with the appraiser. From April 15th to May 15th, typically you will meet with an appraiser one-on-one, -on -one, which is the best way of doing it. They just want to get you in and get you out. And when you present enough evidence of condition of the property, your settlement statement, your contractor repair takeoff, maybe all your pictures. And let me tell you what, guys, we get some doozies of pictures of our houses. When you got crap on the floor built up this high throughout the entire house and it's a hoarder home and this and that and the ceiling's caving in and blah, 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 you, you can paint that picture pretty easy and oftentimes you can get pretty close to the number where you want to get. Now, the problem comes is if you don't get meet with that appraiser, even if you file a 2525D tax protest and you um, want to go after this date, Oftentimes, you can meet with an appraiser one-on-one, -on -one, and that is your ultimate goal. But sometimes, they run you through what is called the ARB, which is the Appraisal Review Board. And guys, they suck. It's three people who claim they know a lot about real estate, and they ain't got no clue. And oftentimes, they just listen to the appraiser that's in the room with you there and those kind of things and listen to him. But sometimes, they don't. I won a deal the other day on this. It was a telephonic review. I actually complimented them for the first time in I don't know how long for making the right decision on this property. It was obvious, this house, that you know it wasn't worth $250,000. It was worth pretty much what we paid for it and why. And I was able to demonstrate all that stuff. And for the, one of the first times, they agreed with me. And I'll give them some latitude. I don't mean to be a dead on. If I'm asking for 60 and they give me 70, am I okay with that? I am okay. But learning how to save money along the way is so important, and this is one of the important things to realize because it's this time of the year to do it. Okay, I'm going to run fast. Anybody remember Bill O'Reilly in the no-spin zone? I think that's where this came from way back, whenever. You know, one of the things I always tell investors out there, there are gurus on every corner of the street, right? Everybody's trying to sell you something. Everybody becomes an overnight expert in our industry. Not true. Just be smart, vet it, you know, be discerning if you're going to buy programs or do things in our industry as to what you're getting out there and be smart along the way. I am going to fly through this because I'm out of time. I'm just going to tell you the way I look at business out there in the wholesale. Everybody know what, who does not know what wholesaling is? Raise your hand. Do you really? Okay. You're selling a contract, right? It's wholesaling. By the way, new provision, you got to make sure you tell your your assignee that you're just selling the contract. That's now property code law. And I don't care what, I mean, yeah, we saw all these stupid numbers in the last few years of wholesaling out there for whatever reason. Everybody was just trying to do it. But in reality, if you're buying a house in this instance, I think I used the numbers here at $65,000, that house needs 15,000 in repairs. That's 80,000. If the house has an appraised value today, of 100 because you ain't selling it for 110 today, unless you're in Highland Park or somewhere where it might be. 
To make money, you got to sell it for $82,000. Who will make $2,000 on a flip fee or $83,000? you got to find that person to buy it. There's only two ways to make more money here, right? Buy it for less money or your rehab has to be less. And you can take these numbers and multiply it by two, by three, by four to get to whatever value you want to get to. But the bottom line is math is math is math. It doesn't lie. So you can either sell somebody that the rehab is not 15, it's 10 because it's rent ready. Or maybe you're on a $300,000 house and the rehab isn't 45000 it's really $30,000. Yeah, no. But that's the wholesaling world out there. On the flip side of this, you can go into the... Uh, the buy and hold side and in everything we do, whether it's rental properties you're buying and holding or mortgages, and I'm just going to scan through this really fast. We don't have time to go through it all. No, there's a pro and con to everything we do out there. And what you've got to do as an investor is figure out which side of the equation you're on. If you're doing this, do you want to be in the rental world and be a landlord? We call it dealing with tenants, toilets and trash. Great. Not a problem. You know, you get to deal with all the issues that come from all that. Maybe you can hire a property manager. That's up to y'all. Uh, it's hard to get an economy of scale unless you have a lot of it where you can either hire somebody or uh, someone else to, to manage it for you along the way. We like the seller finance world a little bit better, you know, simply because I don't have to deal with tenants, toys, and trash. I can get 110% of my sales price. I can get 110% of rent, and I don't, don't have to deal with vacancies in most situations. But both of these equations have pros and cons, and everyone in this business is a little bit different, and you have to figure out where you are and what works. Um, and I'll share some more of that with you in just a moment out there. Again, as, as I said earlier out there, I think that the number one wealth building principle for us is long-term reoccurring cash flow. This is what we're all looking for, because if you have that, go lay on the beach, right? but you've got to get there. If you can't get there, you've got a job. We call it, of course, learning how to be the bank. <sighs> Especially today, I see out there, everybody wants to make money today. They want to put money in their pocket today. Has anybody read that book called The uh, Millionaire Next Door? Yeah. One person has? Two? The Millionaire Next Door. By the way, just Google it, okay? <clears throat> yeah, and just, just by the way, look at the, the things that it talks about in there. Where, you know, a lot of people buy, buy new cars, the millionaire buys the used car. Who does what, how they do things, and the principles of money. Everybody wants to live for the day. No one is willing to live for tomorrow. Learning how to pay off your debt reduce your stuff, your, your, your expenses and those kind of items allows you to get to that point where you really can quit your day job and live off of that. And that is what our ultimate goal is. But unfortunately, we live in a generation right now where it's just more, 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 more. Put it all on credit, do whatever it might be. And guys, you won't ever get there along the way. I'm just going to scan through this real fast. So one of the things I love to talk about just briefly, I'm just going to hit on this, on the wholesaling world, you, you take a $100,000 house that you buy, you fix and flip it, you make three, 4000 bucks. On a fix and flip transaction, it's about the same number. Again, the math doesn't lie. The only way you make more money is to buy it for less or rehab it for less because we all have acquisition costs, we have interest carry, we have title costs, we have mortgage fees we got to pay. We got realtor fees. We got insurance. We all have the same numbers. I don't care who you are, unless you're paying all cash and you don't care about any of that stuff. But we all mostly have those things. In our world, we go into the seller finance world. And what I like about the seller finance world, guys, is when you learn this strategy from a monetary perspective, I will show you how you take that same amount of money, that same property, and over a 24-month period, you can multiply that by four or five times. And that's your true wealth building secret out there in our industry. What's awesome is, is you can do that in your Roth IRA. I'm pumping you guys again because when you do that, guys, you're doing it tax-free. And I'm sorry, if you can save 33, 35, 37, 39% in taxes, I like doing that. So I'm just going to flip on through. So briefly, 
to bore you all one last time. So we do a lot of things in our business today. We've been very fortunate. We don't just do one thing. We are first option title, which means we are a new direct operation. I've been a fee attorney for 30 something years. I said, I'm done. And we're now the decision maker. We are not just uh, here in Dallas Fort Worth. We can close throughout Texas and we actually close nationally if you're doing transactions. The good part about that is we make the decisions and control the deal along the way. I say we make the decisions. We make it along with our underwriter, but it's kind of nice. And we work pretty much 100% into the investor marketplace. Um, we have some awesome things coming online with a major player in our industry. I'm just not going to announce that right now, but it's forthcoming. We are Horn & Associates PC. And guys, our law firm does very simple things. We work with investors to buy and sell houses in the creative finance world, landlord-tenant representation, and foreclosure if that happens, unfortunately. We are the Owner Finance Network. So if you have an interest in learning about seller financing, you can go to the ownerfinancenetwork.com. That is where uh, our training lives. It's where Buku free videos live on everything you want to know about this industry out there. Uh, we are vertically integrated, providing legal and title services for closing, loan processing, loan servicing, this new thing called the new RAP lending bill. If you do more than three in a 12 month period, uh, we have what's called the subject to Academy, which is where Susan and I talk all things seller financing. We do that live, uh, one hour each twice a month. It's really pricey at $99 lifetime to join that. Uh, you'll notice that we're not in this to make money per se, just to cover our costs and expenses, because we're going to make money vertically doing all the services that you have to have for this industry. It's kind of nice to be able to do that. I don't have to charge you guys 10 grand to learn how to do this business. I can charge you a heck of a lot less than that along the way. Uh, most of you don't know that back prior to 08, 09, we were the largest hard money lender in Texas under a company called Funding Partners, uh, where we did about 4,000 plus hard money loans. Today, we're back in the game again under a company called Goat Funding. And one of the interesting things is, is in the hard money lending business, guys, we're all pretty much the same. We're all about 70 cents on the dollar. Our interest rates are about the same. We're probably in the lower 25% on that. Our fees are about the same. So what's the difference? The difference is, is that we come alongside you, we partner with you, not as a true partner, but we try to help you analyze your transaction better so you understand what you're doing. If we think it's a bad deal, we're gonna tell you. If you still wanna do it, do the deal. We're gonna try to help you analyze the property, design the property, and provide our expertise to you. Usually you cannot get that anywhere else in this industry today. So we do a lot of things. We're S2 equity. So if you want to sell a house to us, you got a really great deal. You want to partner and be a real partner with us. Call us. We do all types of things, but we cover the entire gambit of the single family residential investment business out in our marketplace today. And we'd love to help you guys any way we can. So thank you. I hope I finished on time. Scott, you went so long, my battery died, man. <laughs> now, thank you. I wish we could have given this more time. This was great. We really appreciate the content. It's been a while since we've had you here, and I forgot how excellent Scott's content is. So he will be around to ask uh, answer more questions. Um, but I do want to move quickly. We, we are running out of time. Uh, I do want to move to the deal pitching part of the evening. And I'm going to first bring up Ken, who has a rather unique thing that he's going to talk about. So among the things you can do with a self-directed IRA, in addition to a lot of the things that we've talked about with real estate, subject to lending, all the things that Scott was talking about, is also something which has gotten a lot bigger recently, which is private company stock. Companies that are not going public but they are raising capital for internal ownership, perhaps with the intention of going public sometime soon. And so Scott was a guy, um, I'm sorry, Ken <laughs> was a guy who we met just recently, and he is a real estate investor, but he also has a unique opportunity 
for a company that is just in that category. And I'm going to let Scott take about two minutes to talk to you about it. And then again, Scott, I want you to run right at the camera with the helmet <laughs> at the end. Ken, I did this in a meeting the other day. By the way, can I tell you, I've been up since 5 a.m. traveling. I've had a really long day. Ken. No worries. <laughs> Thank you very much. So I'm Ken Lehman. I'm an investor and board member for a startup company called Intelligent Cranium Helmets. We're producing the world's safest and most technologically advanced helmet in the world. You know, a lot of the technologies we enjoy today in the automobile industry have not yet made it to the motorcycle. So we're bringing all that technology into a helmet. So if you look at this helmet, it's got GPS and it's got a heads up display. It can navigate the rider anywhere they wanna go without removing their hands from the handlebars. It's got crash detection. So if you're in an accident, it's gonna call 911 it's also gonna call the rider's emergency contact and let them know that you're in an accident. Also, because it has GPS, it's gonna let them know exactly where you're located. Um, it also has a camera in the front so the rider can record their ride and stream it on social media. It's also got two cameras in the back. The reason there's two cameras in the back is there's a huge blind spot for uh, motorcycle riders on the left and the right side and also behind them. So through the heads up display, the rider can see without turning their head, you know, what's on the sides of them and what's behind them. It also has two proximity sensors. Those proximity sensors will let the rider know if somebody's getting too close to their sides or behind them. There's no knobs, controls, anything like that. It's all voice recognition. So you talk to the helmet and you can control every technology in the helmet just by using your voice. And there's an app on your phone that connects to the helmet. So you can not only control the helmet, you can control apps on your phone. You can send and receive calls. You can stream music to the helmet. You can talk one-on-one -on -one to another rider. You can also do a group chat with multiple riders. So all that technology is there. The demand for this is huge, by the way. There's very few smart uh, helmets out there, and this is the only helmet with all that kind of technology in it. And we've already pre-sold over 300 helmets. We've raised $175,000 on Kickstarter in 72 hours. And so the demand's huge there. Um, so uh, what we're looking for is an investors like yourself who want to come alongside us and help us over the finish line. We only have 15% of the remaining software development to finish. And so we're almost at production ready. Um, so we're looking for people like you that want to come alongside us. We're not a startup company that, it, you know, has an idea written on a napkin, right? We're almost into production. Uh, so if you want to join us, you can use your Quest Trust account. In fact, our latest investor is here in the back, Susan. Uh, Susan is the latest investor. She used her uh, Quest Trust account to invest in this. So if you're interested, you want to hear more, feel free to talk to me or my lovely wife, Karen, in the back there, and we'll answer any questions you have. Awesome. Thank you. Okay. Um, 90 seconds are on the clock for the rest of you who want to do it. Strictly enforced. The rule here, be brief, be bright, be gone. Peyton, you're up. Come on. Oh, and Runday, you're coming too? You don't get 90 seconds each. How y'all doing? Uh, my name is Peyton Merrill. This is my business partner, Rundy West, right here. Say hello. Um, we're investment brokers out of Fort Worth. We deal with uh, multifamily units and uh, small brick and mortars businesses. And if you're interested, just let us know. That is it. That is literally all I had to say to you guys. So that's it. Okay. You want to say something, Matt? <laughs> um, I just want to let everybody know that I'm uh, just in a, I have an account with uh, Quest Trust Group, and I've been enjoying every moment I've been with them. They helped me on a few real estate deals, and man, I, whatever y'all need to do to get involved, make sure you get it done, and I look forward to seeing y'all on the other end. Wow. Thanks. All right. Thank you. 45 seconds to spare. Love it. All right. Who's next? 
Anyone? Ah, here we go. All right. Alex, introduce yourself and tell us what you got. Alex is your Elohim Investment Homes. We do build houses and here we are. <laughs> what, what more can you say? <laughs> All right. I uh, think we got time maybe for one more because we do want to get out of here on time. We want to be out of here at 8.30. Um, we don't want to be rude about it, but um, Chad or Cole, I'm sorry, Cole, right? All right. Here we go. Uh, my name is Cole Novak. It's my first time here. Uh, this is Mike Flaherty. We're both with Novak Capital. And what we do is we create limited partnerships for individual investors to then go build uh, commercial real estate. So, you know, we've got about $250 million of deals in the pipeline in the next 12 months. If anybody here is interested in what we got, then come ask me or Mike. Awesome. Thank you. All right. Let's cut it off there. By the way, coming from Austin, like it's hard to drive around and not see a Novak sign. Just, just want to put it out there. All right. We're going to conclude there. Um, we got about 15 minutes left before Caroline comes up and starts kicking everyone out. So uh, get your last drink. Enjoy the lust bit of networking and thank you guys so much for coming out we hope to see you again either thursday for our lunch and learn or next month at our social thank you all